us. So glad you've joined us. We are in our second message on this Resurrect series, which is really trying to understand how the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus, how that really affects us and relates to us. And our message this weekend is called Alive in Christ. And last week we talked about the story of Lazarus and the story of Jesus going to his friend, waiting two full days after he heard that he was sick, and then standing in front of the tomb, knowing that he was four days dead, and watching the grief and the pain of the people around him, and, and the compassionate heart of Jesus, where Jesus wept, even though he knew exactly what he was going to do. He knew he would be raising Lazarus from the dead in a few moments. And so it shows the plan of God, and it shows the compassion of God, but Lazarus' life was transformed because he had been really dead and then Christ raised him from the dead and he was really alive. And so he became a walking around billboard for the power of God. And some people believed and were attracted and were drawn and interested and some rebelled and rejected and in fact tried to plan not only to kill Jesus but to kill Lazarus. And so my challenge last week was to see ourselves as Lazarus people, that we have been, we died with Christ and we also came alive with him. And the question is, what does that really mean? And I want you to listen carefully this weekend because I'm taking something that's really very complex and it's kind of all the way through the New Testament. And we're going to look at Romans chapters 6, 7, and 8, or a couple of verses from those chapters to try to make something it's really very complex and dense into something that is not oversimplified, but a more clear and perhaps more usable way that it makes how I see myself and how I see the world different than before. And so I want to talk a little bit about what is it, what is it that died and what is it that came alive and how does that actually work in my living around, I mean, living, walking around, talking daily life. So let me give you a, uh, an example and maybe a little confession. So this doesn't happen all at the same time, but often when I'm sitting down and trying to read, trying to study, trying to spend time just uh, with my family or whatever, uh, but particularly in moments of quiet when I'm trying to press into something spiritual, my mind does all kinds of weird things. Sometimes I'll find myself reflecting on somebody that criticized me or hurt me or said something behind my back that I found out about. And boy, it's easy to start letting that build resentment in my heart. Or sometimes it's, it's just a simple, a, it's a simple temptation. It's like, ooh, food sounds good. Why don't I get a snack? And, and I'm trying to focus in and spend time. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, I should go get something to eat. Um, sometimes it's more sinister than that, uh, often triggered by an event, but sometimes just a thought comes in. And it's like, wow, what if I watch that movie? I know it's rated R, and I know there's some kind of sexy scenes in there, and maybe that would be, that'd make me happy right now. Maybe, maybe it's also something that's just, uh, why don't I just spend all my time watching TV, or I wish I could escape and get out of here and just go somewhere fun and and all of these thoughts and feelings can come at one moment and, and they can begin to wrestle inside of me. And there's a variety of responses that I have. Sometimes I think, Paul, shame on you. You're, you're a Christian of many years. You're a pastor. You're, you're somebody who talks to people about their spiritual life. How could you behave this way? And I know that's not the voice of the Spirit. That's that shame and that that, that putting a, a judgment on me. Sometimes I just think, I won't do this. I'm just going to really try hard. I'm going to work, and I don't really say the words, but in my own strength and with my own power to change this. And sometimes I, I just use a simple thing like distract myself, go for a walk, do something else, get my mind off of it. But all of us have this internal battle that's going on inside of us. And I think if you understand the lesson today, it'll help you understand 
that when somebody becomes a follower of Jesus, when, when they ask him into their life, when they surrender to him, all these words we use, when they get saved, when, when they're born again, when they are a new creation, what actually happens in us? Because the better you understand it, the better you will be able to, to win the battle for your mind and your heart and your soul and for how you live. So let's dig in right here. And I want us to start with Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 5. Paul says, Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. And that's such an important scripture that we actually use that when we're baptizing people. Now, there's some debate as to whether this baptized into Christ is referring to what's known as being baptized in the Spirit, which is what happens when we commit our life to Christ. We are baptized into the Spirit and we're put into the body of Christ. Or is this water baptism? And, and it's not clear from the context. I think it's probably spirit baptism, but, but water baptism is a acting out in a public way exactly what has gone on in time, inside spiritually. And so when we put somebody all the way into the water, the picture there is that they are dying to their old self, to their life. That's what the surrender means. And then when we bring them back up, we're saying, you're walking now in newness of life, in the life that Christ gives us. And then he goes on, says, so that we may live a new life, for if we've been united with him in death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in resurrection like his. So it says we're connected, we're identified, we become followers of Jesus, Christians, little Christs, that we're identified both in his death and in his resurrection. And the question is, is what part of me died and what part is for this life and what part is talking about heaven in the future? So on your outline there, if you have a copy of a paper outline or if you are on your app, um, we've got some fun circles to kind of hopefully make this graphically clear and also maybe a chance for you to color in a few squares and write some things. So take notes all over it. So the first picture is just a little bit of a scriptural understanding of what we are made up like inside the Bible talks about our body, soul, and spirit. And so the, the human being has a physical body that is not who I am, but my spirit is in my body and my spirit is connected to and connected with my mind and my emotions. And so we, we sometimes refer to this as the soul and the spirit. But in the state when I am before Christ, before I've come to a relationship with Jesus Christ, this self, the kind of self that we talk about being selfish, so it means my old sin nature, the, the way that I was when I was born because of Adam's sin, I was born in what the Bible calls original sin. And so because of that, the Bible describes my status. I was a rebel. I was far from God. I was doomed and I was a slave to sin. Um, some of those are in Romans chapter 6 and 7. Some of them are elsewhere in the scriptures. But wh what do I mean a rebel? Well, uh, one of the missionaries that I talked to when we were in Cambodia is a woman named Joelle. And she said, you know, I had a hard time. I, I came from a non-church family. And when I first came to church and heard what they called the gospel, this idea that, that I was sinful and that my sin deserved death, and because of that, Jesus had to die. I thought to myself, I haven't done anything that serious. Why, why would, I mean, I've been a pretty good kid. And why would those sins result in death? And why would Jesus have to die? And she said, I asked that question for quite a while. And she said, finally, somebody down and sat, sat down with her and said, well, here's the picture. Jesus is your creator. And he is your king. He is the one who designed your life and he has a plan for you to live. And all our life, we live in treason to the king. We have rebelled against him and we don't want him to tell us what to do. We don't want to live his life. We're not on his mission. We want our own kingdom. So we are committing treason against the king of heaven. <laughs> Joel said, that, 
that made a lot of sense to me. All of a sudden, right? Oh, trees and yeah, that's a big deal. And that's the way the Bible talks about us, that we were enemies of Christ, that we were far from God, especially the Gentiles, that we were doomed. The Bible says that we're under the wrath of God. And therefore, if we go out into eternity like that, the Bible says we will spend eternity separated from God, which is called hell. And then Romans 6 says we're a slave to sin because the self is in control and our old nature has taken over. There are three forces that are working to keep us a slave to sin. So our battle is against the world, the flesh, and the devil. You may have not have thought about this, but those three, some have called that the unholy trinity, are arrayed against us to try to destroy us and cause us to live a life that is outside of God's plan, that, that is destroyed because we're under his wrath. So let me describe a little bit each one of those, because if you understand what the opposition looks like, then you're going to realize how, how little chance you have to stand against it in your own strength by yourself, if you will. So the world, 1 John says, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love for the Father is not in them. Now, part of the reason we have trouble understanding these concepts is because the word world is used in different ways. Sometimes it means the planet we live on, our world. Sometimes, in like in John 3, 16, it says, God so loved the world. Well, that is talking about the people who are on the world. But when 1 John talks about it, he's saying there is a system. In fact, here's the definition if you want to write it down. Any system designed to find life apart from God. So let me explain that. Sometimes when we think of the world, we think of, all of the awful, evil parts of the world. The way that sin is manifested in, in violence, in the warfare we see in our world today, in sexual immorality, in oppression, in hurting other people. And clearly we know, wow, that, that is ugly. But the world is also sometimes just very uh, humanistic is a term that's used. That it's all about people and saving people and it's, it's often cloaked in the best language of care for each other and do good things. But the whole premise underneath it is that the human being is the top of the pyramid. We're not interested in God. We don't believe in him. We don't want any rules. We don't want him telling us what's true about sexuality, about gender, about morality. We want to do our own thing and make our own way. And then sometimes it's even more subtle than that. There are false religions, not only the worship of idols, but systems of belief that say that we can attain salvation by our own activities, our own works. All of those are the world. So the world has many different facets to it, but all of them are designed to help us live a life apart from God, in rebellion to God. And then he says the next part is the flesh. And Romans 8 says, the mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It doesn't submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Again, this can be confusing because sometimes flesh just means your body. It just means your physical body. In fact, Jesus, the Son of God, became flesh, John chapter 1. He took on a human form. Obviously, that was not sinful. So sometimes when we talk about the flesh, it just means the limitations of being human. But quite often, flesh talks about this idea that our sin nature, that's really talking about our sin nature, that that which is in us that is rebelling against God. And so here's the definition I want you to write down. Our old sin nature that pulls us away from God's plan for us. So we've got the world with all of its ideas and thoughts and teachings and plans. And we've got the flesh, which is in us, our old sin nature that is attracted to all the lies and all the wrong things. And then the third problem we have, the third force, is there's a devil. First Peter says, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. So the reality is, is this is not just a system of belief or a, a system of habits in our past. No, the devil is a fallen angel who's set on destroying the work of God. 
In John 10, Jesus said, the thief comes to steal, to kill, to destroy. So Satan's goal is to destroy the work of God. So if he can keep as many people as possible from knowing who Jesus is and from following him, then that's his number one goal. And secondarily, if people do decide to follow Jesus and are transformed, then he wants to defeat and make them discouraged and lie to them and cause us to live in all kinds of ways that are not honoring to God. So you think about that. Why, why is a person who is outside of Christ, why are they hopeless? Well, because we have a sin nature in us. We've got the world, the flesh, and the devil against us. And so the Bible says, and this sounds like it's fatalistic, the Bible says that we are dead, that we are caught, that we are hopeless without Christ. So then what happens when we become in Christ? So the Bible talks about salvation in a number of ways, but it, it involves believing that Jesus really is God, believing that he came to earth and lived in the flesh, that he really died on the cross, that he was really buried and then he was raised again from the dead. And then I not only believe that intellectually, I come to repent of my own rebellion against God and I surrender my life and submit to him. And in, in that sense, I, I die to my old life. And then even more amazing than that is I put the triangle on the throne of the life here, that your spirit is made alive by the spirit of God and that, that Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, comes and lives in our bodies, literally that we now have the Spirit of Christ in us. And the Bible says an amazing things about our new identity in Christ, who we are now that we have come to believe and to commit our lives to Christ, and he's come to dwell in us. The Bible says, I'm pardoned. <laughs> That's what you do with somebody who's been a, in treason. They have to be pardoned by the, the king. I am now loved and adopted. Well, I've always been loved, but now I am brought from being far from God to being a part of his family. I am heaven bound. Instead of being doomed to the destruction that I was headed towards, now I am guaranteed a home with God forever and that I am free to serve God. In fact, in Romans chapter 7, it talks about kind of strangely, it says, no longer are you slaves to sin. Now you can be slave to righteousness or to what is good, that we're actually free to serve God. And that, that sounds so amazing. And sometimes we tell people, here's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And they think, oh man, life's going to be easy now. This is going to be great. But you know what? We still, while we are in here on this earth, we still have the world, the flesh and devil that we have to deal with, that we are in this body. And therefore we have to learn to stand against the world and the flesh and the, and the devil. So Romans chapter 6 talks a lot about this idea that if we died with Christ, then we will also live with him. And then it talks about the fact in Romans chapter 7 that there's this battle that still goes on inside of us. Now, this is a little controversial passage, but, but I really think he's talking about the same battle that every believer has. And so he says it like this. Now, if I do what I don't want to do, it's no longer I who do it, but it's sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. So how do we put that on our little chart? How do you draw that? So the Holy Spirit comes and he lives and he makes our spirit alive. And the Holy Spirit wants to speak to our minds, specifically through the word of God. And he wants to help us control and, and, and filter our emotions. He wants us to help in our body to live in self-control and in, in morality and in impurity. And we are given a new nature. Our spirit is made alive. But the self is still there. The self is still able to be influenced by the world, the flesh and the devil, the, the many voices around us and the... <laughs> the clever nature that we have within us that can fool us. And then, of course, Satan, who likes to whisper and to, and to work behind the scenes to destroy us. So what happens is often we don't really know how to fight this battle. We, we get it that it's real, 
But you can't just try harder. You can't just say, come on, Glazner, get your act together. Don't you know what you're supposed to do? Don't you know what the truth is? Don't you, don't you know how to, to take care of this? Why don't you just do better? It, it ends up with some of the most frustrated Christians I know because they believe that they had to become a Christian by faith in Jesus. But really, they believe that they have to fight this battle by trying to do it in their own strength. And sometimes that means accountability and it means working really hard. It often means really condemning yourself when you fail. That's one of the signs that you're doing it in your own strength. If you're saying, terrible person, I can't believe you did that. Why would you do that? That voice of condemnation is not the voice of the Spirit. And so the truth is that we are still powerless to fight against the world and flesh and the devil in our own strength. So I want to give you an identity and a pattern to be able to fight this battle in a way that you will win more often. We never get to the place of maturity where we don't sin ever, but you should see progress in the Spirit of God working in you and listening carefully to hear the Spirit of God and in being obedient to the faith that we've been called to. So, we move over to Romans chapter 8, which is one of the most wonderful chapters in the whole Bible. And it starts like this. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Paul's been explaining to the Jewish people that the law that Moses gave them was not to save them. It was to show them how desperately they needed a Savior. That the, the purpose of the law is actually to show us that we can't do it in our own strength. And so he says, he goes on and he says, For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering, and so he condemned sin in the flesh. So he says, we're powerful because we can't do it in our own strength. That's the first flesh. And then God the Son became a human being so that he could condemn sin in the flesh, so that he could end the rule and the reign of sin in human beings. So he says, here's the good news. Not only have you been pardoned, but you have a brand new identity. You, have, you cannot win this battle in the flesh, in your own strength, in trying harder. And so then he goes on and he says, in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us. Everything the law says is now met in those followers of Jesus who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires, but those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. I hope you'll go back and read the devotions this week because you're going to walk through some of these passages a little more carefully and a little more slowly. But when you get to this, this is like the crescendo of a great piece of music. He says there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus because we have a new freedom and we have a new identity. We have a ability in listening to the Spirit of God and being empowered by the Spirit of God to actually be set free. The, the, the new identity part is really important. And I hope you can get this because he goes on and he says, those who have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. That means that I can't just say, Paul, you need to do better. I need to have this inner dialogue that says, okay, Holy Spirit, today I again commit myself to you. I am going to let you lead me. I'm going to let you direct me. I'm going to let you give me power so that all the impulses that are coming can be screened through the power of the Spirit. And then this idea that now that I have a new nature, that's the deepest me. Let me explain that. When I choose to let the Spirit control, I'm denying my sin nature and being true to my deepest self. See, see before people come to Christ, especially in America, the, the, the idea is like, be true to yourself. Whatever you feel, whatever you want, however you identify yourself, live it out. That's the ultimate freedom. In reality, 
They're just being hoodwinked by the world, the flesh, and the devil. And they're living in all kinds of variety of ways apart from God. And when I am a follower of Jesus, one of the scriptures that says deny myself, it doesn't mean deny who I now am as the deepest new person in Christ. It means that I deny my sin nature. I deny the old self. But the reality is, when I am saying no to sin by the power of the Spirit, get this, I am being true to my deepest self. In other words, the new nature that God has created in me, I want to love God. I want to follow God. I want to have purity in my life. I want to serve Him. I want to see His kingdom grow. I want to serve other people. But that is the truest and deepest nature. So, when Christ comes in and he transforms me, now I really am not only holy because he's called me holy, but because in my deepest nature, that's what I want. So let me give you an illustration. Say something comes on TV and you know it's rated R and you know there's going to be some ugly stuff there that is ugly language and maybe sexual scenes or overly violent or whatever. And it's like your spirit, this whole, the Holy Spirit in you says, no. Don't do that. You can either say, I'm going to do it anyway. I don't care. Disobeying the Spirit of God in you. Or you can say, well, you know, I should shut this off. The kids might walk in and what would my pastor think? Uh, what would my wife think? What, what would somebody else think? And I better turn it off. But what you believe is I really want to watch this. I'm just being good. And that is trying to do it in your own strength. And the third way is that when the Holy Spirit whispers to you, you need to shut that off. Instead of watching it down to the last dot as it closes and saying, oh, I got to deny myself. You surrender to the Spirit and by the Spirit's power, you say, you know what? When I get done watching that, I'm going to know that that was a violation. I'm going to feel ashamed of it. I'm going to feel the guilt. That's not who I am. That's not what I want. That the Spirit of God actually gives you the power to live in alignment with the new nature that Christ has given you. That you're being deeply true to yourself. The new self that God has made. And you're denying the old self that's so, so shot through with the world, the flesh, and the devil. And I hope that that helps you when you're facing those temptations that you listen to the Spirit, that you, by the Spirit's power, say no to the sin, but you know that you are ultimately living out of your truest and deepest self. That, that concept has helped me so much. And then the last circle on your paper it says, In the future, because I died with Christ, not only do I have Christ's nature in me as I live, eternal life starts the moment you become a follower of Jesus. But you know what? The best is yet to come. So the, in the future, I will be resurrected. How do we know that? Because Christ was raised from the dead. And in fact, the body that he had is kind of like a prototype model of what we are going to have. We don't know that much about it, but we're going to have new bodies. Um, 2 Corinthians 5 says that this body that we have, which is an incredible, this is the coolest car you'll ever drive. It's an incredible organism. But this is, the, this is the camping out model. This is the tent. This is the temporary. He said, then we're going to have a building made not with hands, not, not from humanity, but made by God, a building that's permanent in the heavens. So we're going to be resurrected to a new body. We're going to be fully, fully free. So when we first give our life to Christ, we are freed from the penalty of sin, pardoned. When we are living in Christ, we are being freed from the power of sin on a day-to-day-to-day -to -day -to -day basis. And then ultimately, we're going to be freed from the presence of sin. We're not going to have the world or the flesh or the devil in heaven. We're going to be absolutely free to glorify God, to live in connection with Him, and in love, love relationship with Him and with everybody else that's there. And then we're going to be home. That's such an important concept. Instead of thinking of our life as being here and now, that's actually what we're designed for. 
that God you know, is me recreating it in us dying and coming alive again. He's recreated us to be citizens of heaven. And so when you feel out of place here, when the world doesn't seem quite to fit, when, when things aren't going like you'd hoped they would, part of it's because you're not home yet. You haven't finally reached your ultimate destination. And that is so important for us to realize that that forever is the way that we're going to look back at this life. That the truest view of our life is from the point of heaven looking back over how we lived our life. And if you can take these truths from these rich chapters, and even as you read them again this week, if you can let them begin to permeate your soul so that you have a new identity, who I see myself to be as a Lazarus, raised from the dead, I'm alive in Christ, and what's coming in the future? And then how do I fight the world and the flesh and the devil? By listening to the Spirit and by surrendering to Him. And if you can get those concepts to become a part of your everyday mental conversation, your life will be transformed. I hope this is helpful. This is so complex. There's, this could be a whole theology class, but I hope you get the key ideas that will help you in your daily eating, breathing, walking around life, and that you can live a Lazarus life of a resurrected follower of Jesus. Thanks for joining us. I'll turn it over to the campus pastors. And or if you're watching online, I'll be back in just a minute. Love you guys. So what are we going to do in our, in our, our life this week? Uh, this transformational moment, I hope, is going to help you take some of these complex things we talked about and make them so that they're something that you can really actually do this week. So the first thing is believe that you're a new creation. Think through, as we talk through chapters 6, 7, and 8 of Romans, and come to really believe that that's what happened if you've become a follower of Jesus. And if you've never become a follower of Jesus, let me tell you, that's the best decision you'll ever make. And then secondly, here's a practice. There's your belief, and then here's your, your life change practice. Start every day with an invitation to the Holy Spirit that lives in us to lead me and a commitment to saying, whatever you say, that's what I'm going to do. Try doing that. Try getting your heart and your mind set on obeying the Spirit and on living out of your deepest identity. And you'll have to, <laughs> you'll have to re-up several times in the day. But start your morning by saying, Holy Spirit, I'm going to listen to you and I'm going to obey immediately. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you for these important concepts that rewrite how we see ourselves and how we see you. And I know that some of these concepts are, are high and complex. And I ask by your Spirit this week that you would remind us of who we are and of who you are and what the battle is about and that you would help us to fight in the power and the strength of the Spirit. And God, that you would bring growth and maturity and transformation out of this. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for joining us.